My name is Tom Dijah. The book I've written is called The Third Coast, When Chicago Built the American Dream. Well, I think of Chicago has an identity, and certainly in this period, it was regular. Regular is the kind of hallmark of what a Chicagoan is. It's a flat place. It's almost surprisingly flat. You know, it's a prairie. It used to be the prairie, and you would just see forward into the distance forever, and you still have that. You drive down a big street in Chicago, and it just keeps going and going and going, you know, and that, that kind of flatness had, I think, a kind of psychological effect on people. You know, it encouraged a certain kind of leveling of people. You know, you were happy to have your house and your wife and your kids and you didn't bother anybody else and they didn't bother you. And that attitude helped, I think, bridge ethnicities, which in Chicago were always warring with each other, but there became a kind of common currency of, you know, you're a regular guy, you know, and that filtered into a lot of other ways of thought, whether they're criminal or not. But being regular is really important. And the impact that that has on America as a whole is that since a lot of that mass market stuff comes out of Chicago, deciding what's regular in the rest of the country was also something that Chicago helped create. Um, there were choices made, you know, advertising, Leo Burnett was out of Chicago. So things like the Marlboro Man and the Green Giant and all these things, you know, there's a lot of what the market considered regular was coming out of Chicago too. So is that something strong? You know, regular things can be pretty strong. So I, I, that, that ethos, for better or worse, is I think the backbone of Chicago. Part of what's happening in Chicago during this period is that there's a battle to a certain degree between that people-oriented mindset of Studs Terkel and Gwendolyn Brooks and, and the blues coming out of it. But the other thing that Chicago is really good at is serving the mass market. You know, it's the home of Montgomery Ward, it's the home of Sears, it's the home of a lot of big businesses. At the same time, these vernacular things are coming out and getting attention. There's the rise of these other big consumer things that their tendency is to either completely compromise and turn those things for the mass market or stomp them out, you know. And that battle is a lot of what's going on in Chicago at this time. And, and, and so what happens, of course, is that consumer side wins, you know, and it wins. And I think one of the ways you bring back that kind of people-oriented mindset is, is happening to a certain degree. I think the internet, I think there are a lot of ways that writers and artists of all kinds in Chicago are finding ways to be heard and not just sort of be out there in the wilderness. Arthur Siegel, a photographer in Chicago, said it, we were like islands in a vast sea. And I don't think that's necessary anymore. I think there are more ways for people to connect. You know, I don't have an answer for how to make it better, but I think the book can hopefully help create a, maybe a different kind of identity, a different way of looking at the city and grabbing some of these things back. I, you know, I think that the Chicagoans who have left the city are not expatriates or we're not in exile. I think we're exports. Um, there's an interesting relationship between people who come to Chicago. A lot of the most interesting people in this book aren't from Chicago. Mahaley is from New Orleans. Studs Terkel is born in New York. Nelson Algren is from Detroit. There's all kinds of people who come to Chicago and, and start new things. And the city is, though it's famous for kind of people leaving, in fact, those people go out and tend to act like Chicago wins, you know? And I think they bring some of those values and some of those ideas about regular and the common man and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think they take them into the rest of the country. So in a certain way, that job that I'm calling for has been going on, you know, in a certain way. We Chicagoans just go off and do it, and we keep meeting for bear games and to cry over the Cubs at a certain points. But, you know, um, it, why is it so strong? It, it's a good place, you know. Even at its worst, there is a kind of strength to it because it, there are no illusions about what it's about. It wasn't started for a religion. It wasn't started out of happenstance. It, it's Everybody came there pretty much because they wanted to in a lot of ways. And so... Um, you got your little plot of land and you kept to yourself and there is something basic about that and, and I think that still lives on in the people who come out of Chicago. Oh, I think Chicago still has major city glamour. You know, there's still you know, 2.7 million people there. It's still the home of a lot of great industries. It, it, is a, uh, it is still a major American city, number three in that sense. So I don't think they're in danger of that. I think what we need as a country is a little bit more of a dose of what Chicago used to bring to America, which was, I think, a connection to the people of America. All the things that I talk about in this book come out of a certain aesthetic that Chicago produced that I think was unique, and a lot of it drew from whether it was the politics of the labor movement, 
um, artistic movements that were really people oriented, like Maholi Naj and his Everyone is Talented idea. Uh, all these things work together, I think, to create a, an unusually people oriented mindset that found its way into a lot of things as the American century kind of grew out of the post war era. So, and we lost that at a certain point. Some of that was because of Chicago itself, some of that was demographic, economic location, all these things that develop over time. But altogether, I think we lost it. And restoring that idea of Chicago and what it can bring to the table, um, I think would be good for us.